Um, my name's Alan Ware, and I'm with the World Federalist uh, Movement, Institute for Global Policy and the World Future Council. Uh, we are one of the co-hosts of Mobilising an Earth Governance Alliance, which is what we're launching today. So thank you very much for those of you who have joined us in person here, uh, and also to all of you who have joined us online. And just a couple notes on preliminaries, housekeeping. I know we're all very familiar with Zoom at this point, but this event is being recorded and will be made public online. Kindly use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen um, if you'd like to make an intervention. And um, we look forward to a quite a rich discussion with plenty of time for question and answers um, after our illustrious speakers. Um, so with that, my name is Rebecca Schutt. I am the Executive Director of Citizens for Global Solutions, um, which was founded with the World Federalist Movement by a declaration just um, miles from where we're sitting, kilometers from where we're sitting in Mount Close, Switzerland. And so it's a, a real pleasure to be back here as we launch the um, Mobilizing Earth Governance Alliance. I will hand you to our chair, who will take over my literal seat so that you might be able to see him as he introduces today's program. Uh, so for those of you online who didn't quite capture that, uh, when Rebecca said, introduced where we are, we are here in Geneva. Uh, we are in a beautiful room called the Mont Blanc Room of Sydney Austin Law Firm. It's called that because we're looking out the window at the Swiss Alps and Mont Blanc is in front of us. A lovely reminder of the nature that, and the world that we're here to protect and make sure that we have this beautiful world for future generations. Again, my name is Alan Ware. I'm originally from Aotearoa, Aotearo, New Zealand. So I'm just going to give a short um, uh, welcome in the language from my country, Māori, which is also a greeting to all of you who are participating here, but also to our wonderful world ecosystem. E papa tua nuku, e ai rangi nui e tu nei, tēnā koe. E papa tua nuku, tāko tua nei, tēnā koe. Ngā hau e whā, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou katoa. So welcome to all of you from around the world. Welcome to our sky, our earth, and the world's ecosystems. So we are going to start um, with a number of speakers, and then we'll have possibilities for interventions and questions from both in person and, uh, and uh, uh, online. Yeah, reminder, the event is about mobilizing an Earth Governance Alliance. So Earth Governance is about mechanisms for cooperating together to ensure that we have a safe, sustainable, healthy future um, and how do we organize that? So we've got some experts on governance to speak um, and also many others on the science that's around and on politics. Uh, we are holding this at the same time as 1,400 parliamentarians from around the world are gathered just across the street at the Inter-Parliamentary Union Assembly. So some of us who are here in person are running back and forwards and taking the ideas from here, from this alliance, into the policymakers of the world. Uh, and that's part of what the Alliance is about, is to cooperate between scientists, between policymakers, between civil society and other stakeholders, between the private sector as well, and we'll hear speakers from that. So I'm going to pass it over back to Rebecca, who's going to introduce our first speaker, who's speaking by a pre-recorded uh, message, video message. Rebecca. Uh, so it is my great pleasure um, and privilege to introduce President Mary Robinson, the Chair of the Elders. She was the first woman president of Ireland and former UN High Commissioner for Human Rights. She's a passionate advocate for gender equality, women's participation in peace building, human dignity and climate justice. She's a recognized global voice on climate change and frequently highlights the need for drastic action from world leaders, as well as the intersectionality of the climate emergency, from intergenerational injustice to gender equality and biodiversity loss. President Robinson comes to us by uh, the means of a pre-filmed video message, um, and we look forward to her comments. We all share one planet, but today our common home and our common humanity are under existential threat from serious and interconnected crises. These crises include systemic inequality, fast intensifying climate and nature change, the rapid loss of biodiversity and natural resource depletion, severe and widespread pollution and increasing conflict. The world's poorest and most vulnerable people are the ones hit the hardest and worst by these impacts, 
yet they tend to be the least responsible. This is a profound global injustice which needs to be urgently addressed. At its heart is a failure to govern the way we own, manage, use and distribute our planetary resources for the benefit of current and future generations. We face a crisis of governance. Today, we're in the midst of a planetary emergency and have limited time left to change course. We have to act now with both urgency and ambition. But there's also hope. Thanks to advances in technology and human understanding, we could be on the cusp of achieving a global green energy transformation, regenerative agriculture, and new ways of managing our complex ecosystems. Innovative solutions are increasingly available and can be scaled up through supportive governance approaches. Earth system governance, which takes a whole of systems approach to the crises we face, seeks to bring together ambitious proposals to facilitate implementation of stronger international laws and governance, transcending competing national interests in order to protect our shared ecosystems and planetary well-being. MIGA, the Mobilising on Earth Governance Alliance, is a coalition of civil society organisations working in cooperation with like-minded governments and other stakeholders to strengthen existing environmental governance mechanisms and establish new mechanisms where needed. MIGA seeks to be a leading voice in this respect, striving for the common good of all, all around the world. MIGA supports a number of existing proposals to achieve these structures, such as those set forth in the landmark report of the Climate Governance Commission governing our planetary emergency. The report, which forms the backbone of MIGA's Earth Governance Framework, presents a series of top 10 near-term proposals for global governance reform to be implemented within the next one to three years and top five medium-term proposals to be implemented within the next three to five years. At the heart of the work of MIGA, as highlighted in the reports of the Climate Governance Commission, is the bridging of the gap between climate science and policy. For example, a climate science, a science policy action network which can advise on the best available science and the policies to follow it is critical to ensure the Earth remains within safe planetary boundaries. This must be coupled with the phasing out of fossil fuels and increased support for ambitious green energy proposals, along with the utilization of new and indigenous knowledge and the protection and promotion of human rights and women's empowerment. Multilateral reforms must ensure a fundamental overhaul of the international economic and financial architecture to provide the necessary finance for a just green transition. Low and middle income countries must be given the support they need to develop clean energy infrastructure, regenerative agriculture and cleaner production systems for a new green revolution of minerals and extractive industries. MIGA can support a just transition that prioritises ambitious and equitable reforms. Its work covers a breadth of proposals and already has numerous supporters. Through continued leadership and the building of smart coalitions, MIGA will work together at this crucial time to protect the planet for current and future generations. As Chair of the Elders and a committed advocate for climate justice, I congratulate MIGA on its launch and look forward to continued collaboration in pursuit of our shared goal, a sustainable planet where everyone enjoys peace, justice and human rights. Thank you. We thank very much Mary Robinson for incredible leadership of the Climate Governance Commission for the message for the uh, launch today of mobilising an Earth Governance Alliance um, and for her other incredible work to ensure that we have 
a safe and healthy uh, environment for current and future generations. This is quite a good segue to our next speaker, who's Maya Rock, who was the convener of the Climate Governance Commission. And so Maya was the one who helped bring together the experts from science, from policy, from academia, uh, into the Climate Governance Commission in order to examine a whole range of proposals for environmental governance in order to come out with a report which is incredibly useful and which has served as a basis for the proposals and campaigns that the Mobilising and Earth Governance Alliance is putting forward. So Maya is going to, is the, um, going to give us a little bit more of an um, update on the Climate Governance Climate Governance Commission and some of those uh, really important proposals for us to think about. Maya, the floor is yours. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Alan and Rebecca, and greetings to everybody on this occasion of formally la launching the Mobilizing Earth Governance uh, Alliance. So from the perspective of the Climate Governance Commission, I'll just give you a little bit more background on uh, its operation and work and, you know, really the genesis and a precursor sort of initiative which has flown into, led to uh, the mega project. So we can go to the next slide. Wonderful. So the Climate Governance Commission, we started with a small global strategy meeting in late 2019 at Ban Ki-moon's Global Green Growth Institute. And since then we've grown to uh, a huge network of experts all around the world, uh, across every region, as well as these extraordinary commissioners. And uh, you saw President Robertson and she kindly agreed to be the lead co-chair for the Climate Governance Commission. And you can see the other uh, commissioners, uh, another co-chair is Maria Fernanda Espinosa, former president of the UN General Assembly from Ecuador, Johan Rockström, um, our scientific co-chair, amongst many other just fabulous uh, visionary experts around the world from small island developing states, for example. We have a wonderful Chinese and Indian experts. Uh, we have three youth commissioners uh, and so on. So it's been just a, a really fabulous group to help inform the work of the Climate Governance Commission, which is, as Mary uh, correctly said and, and eloquently said in her comments, we are really facing a crisis in governance uh, uh, in, in the planetary emergency and the climate uh, crisis that we have to tackle and tackle head on. And that is really a, a key goal of MEGA. Next slide, please. And Next animation. So speaking of the science, uh, the Climate Governance Commission really as a foundational principle has taken the science, the latest planetary science to inform its work uh, with the premise, okay, if we took the latest planetary earth system science as a given and really were informed by it, what would our governance look like? Uh, so many of you know or have seen this planetary boundaries framework uh, first proposed in 2009 by Johan Rockström and other international scientists, uh, which now shows, as of the latest update, we are overshooting six of, uh, six of nine of these planetary boundaries. Uh, and we have also, in terms of the climate uh, boundary in particular, a very, very small carbon uh, budget left six to seven years. Uh, under our current emissions, where we really need to start to think about very urgent and upscaled action. And even if we manage somehow with really vigorous, bold, decisive uh, action by the international community, which of course is a, is a big challenge, uh, we may still overshoot the 1.5 degree boundary uh, uh, set out in the Paris Agreement. So we're going to have uh, to uh, take a phrase from uh, Johan Rockström, uh, some some very rough weather or very uh, rocky tra trajectory uh, where um, the whole planet, in fact, will have to think very differently about international human security, how we restabilize uh, the Earth system, and how we govern, indeed, all of these planetary boundaries, which are, in fact, interdependent. Next slide, please. Oops. And the U.S. Secretary General, in fact, has uh, underlined. Next slide has underlined uh, that this is indeed a crossroads for the international community. He said, we need a breakthrough if we are not going to break down. So MEGA, in fact, uh, wants to assist, wants to support the international community at this crucial time 
in human history, bringing people, civil society, like-minded states, the business community together around the world to really offer uh, a bold vision, helping to fill the leadership gap that we see now to confront our challenges. Next slide, please. So the Climate Governance Commission in 2021 introduced an interim report uh, where we, uh, we diagnosed three climate action gaps. One, the solution action gap. We have the solutions under current technology, but they're not being uh, deployed uh, rapidly enough uh, at scale around the world. We have a policy gap. Uh, policy is very inadequate still. It's a patchwork. It is not uh, being tailored so that we can uh, implement these solutions in time and at scale. And lastly, uh, the governance gap, uh, including the international governance gap, where we have to take fresh perspectives on our international governance, but also connected to the regional levels, to national levels, local levels. So there's interdependence and harmony amongst the levels, but really also take this planetary and international governance lens very seriously. Next slide, please. So this is, uh, for your information, a set of uh, policy papers that the Climate Governance Commission uh, produced in its phase one working with uh, fantastic international experts around the world, which really take this global governance and international cooperation lens very seriously uh, in terms of if we took uh, international cooperation as a given, if we really intensified our mutual support, collaboration, what would some of the measures be that we would take? Next slide, please. Uh, then we supplemented this background work with uh, several meetings of our Climate uh, Governance Commission commissioners, this is our meeting last June at the Villers Institute, just down the road here in Switzerland, uh, that kindly hosted this meeting with uh, President Robinson. Uh, you see one of our youth commissioners there, and Marie Fernanda, Johan Rockstrom, one Jira Matai, who's the head of WRI Africa, uh, amongst others. Who And we really put our heads together to think about, okay, what are our top 10 near-term proposals and top five medium-term proposals of what we want to share and propose for the international community. Next slide, please. So this report uh, was the outcome of those high-level meetings with the commissioners, a lot of intensive uh, debates and dialogues released just in advance of COP28 in November of last year. Next slide. So this is a visualization of our top 10 near-term proposals, which you can read at leisure uh, in, in the report governing our planetary emergency. Uh, but just to flag a few, which we hope uh, will be taken forward and, and really supported by MEGA, uh, urgently improving the climate COPs to be focused on delivery action accountability, uh, a declaration of planetary emergency by the UN General Assembly, for example, uh, also enhancing international scientific capacity for full earth system governance to defragment our current uh, scientific uh, monitoring and advisory bodies to really uh, connect them to ensure that we are monitoring the full set of earth system risks that we're currently running. Next slide. And then our medium term proposals include some uh, very uh, classical proposals that have been made time and time again from uh, climate scientists, uh, environmental experts, uh, former heads of state have proposed a global environment agency, uh, as well as International Court for the Environment. We have very uh, well-known leading uh, international environmental legal practitioners proposing such a facility. So we will be in parallel to the new term proposals, uh, working on these medium term proposals the new institute uh, based in Hamburg will be supporting and facilitating this further expert dialogue, which then also must involve global civil society and mega in it. So we bring these, these ideas and these reforms really to policymakers and help the international community have the capacity and have adequate support to really think about this next generation architecture. Next slide. So just to end uh, a few visualizations uh, about my hopes for, for mega, uh, this is a slide from our friends at Common Home of Humanity who, that is already a, a, a member of MEGA, uh, showing the uh, what they call the software and the hardware of the earth, all those arrows, the, the biophysical systems, the climate systems, uh, saltwater, freshwater, et cetera, uh, that keep us in a safe operating space as, as, as a species. 
And how can we collectively now really have a laser focus on restabilizing, protecting, taking care of this uh, common earth system? And next slide, just to end also, as uh, Mary Robinson so beautifully shared, we need to have uh, justice at the, at the center. We need to have inclusion, uh, gender equality, uh, fairness, justice also at the center of, of all our efforts and indeed include all of humanity. So I'll end there and pass over to you, John. Thank you very much, Maya. Um, and just a, a reminder that the Climate Governance Commission reports <coughs> the 2021 and the flagship report of last year, November, both on the um, Mobilising an Earth Governance Alliance website. Uh, also, many of the proposals which Maya uh, presented here are also on the MEGA website under the proposal section. We give a very brief outline of them and then give you the link to the report to get more in-depth explanation of those for those that interest you the most. So thank you very much, Maya. Um, I'm now going to introduce our next speaker, John Blasto, who is the chair of the World Federalist Movement uh, Institute for Global Policy, my boss. Uh, you may recognize the name of the organization because it's been uh, instrumental in establishing a really important global governance mechanism, which is an international criminal court. Uh, it was WFM that set up the coalition for the International Criminal Court and chaired it for a number of years, and we already see that in operation. So when we're looking at these global governance proposals, We've had experience of, from the idea to the in-depth exploration of how they might work to building a smart coalition to, to get the proposal up and running, working with like-minded governments and then seeing it in operation. So this is not just idealistic pie in the sky. These are concrete proposals for governance mechanisms that we are now coalescing around to build smart coalitions, uh, impact coalitions in order to make them operable. So that we, we're, we're really happy to have John here. Now, one other thing I should mention about John, he's a very accomplished mountain climber. And I think if it wasn't for the planetary emergency, he wouldn't be in this room. He'd be in those Alps just over here, I'm in Mont Blanc or one of those others. But there is a planetary emergency. So we're very happy to have you in the room, John. And hopefully we'll solve this so you can get back to mountain climbing. Thank Sometime you very, soon. Thank, thank you. you very much, Alan. Is there a camera I'm looking at here? This one? Yes. Very good. Uh, well, since since I mentioned the mountains, which I wasn't anticipating, uh, it's kind of the mountains that bring me here because when you do spend your time climbing the mountains, you can see the impacts of climate change. Uh, for example, ski touring in Chamonix, which I'm looking at out of the window here. Uh, you look at the old trails, you follow the old trail, and when you get to the edge of the glacier, rather than the trail continuing, now there's a 100 meter cliff because the glaciers have retreated. So it really brings home that climate change has happened. Now, I will come back to the slides at the end of this time, but let me tell you a little bit about the origin of the mega programs. So I met Myra a couple of years ago at COP26 in Glasgow. Um, we both agreed that it was kind of serious that humanity wasn't taking good care of its planet. It kind of matters. The solution is, is simple at a high level, which is humanity needs to take better care of its planet. And Maya, had, as she's just told you, she'd been working for a couple of years on this already. She produced an interim report by then, um, working on the details of how humanity can take better care of the planet. At that point, uh, a couple of years ago, I'd just been elected chair of the World Federalist Movement. As Alan mentioned, uh, the World Federalist Movement created the Coalition for the International Criminal Court, so-called smart coalition of state and non-state actors that had a real world impact on global governance and holding people to account. So Maya and I, both being very bright, put these two ideas together and thought, why don't we apply the smart coalition approach to the Climate Governance Commission report to implement its recommendations? And hey, Preston, that's Megan. Let me be clear about the ambition. If the recommendations of the Climate Governance Commission report are fully implemented, we can comprehensively solve the environment, poly, uh, environment poly crisis. Climate change, damage between the oceans, biodiversity, comprehensive, if we sort out the governments. Plus, by creating effective, equitable, and accountable global governance of the environment, 
we then have a mechanism that could be applied equally to other global challenges. War, inequality, AI, pandemics, at root, these are all questions of global governance. On the other hand, our current path leads to Armageddon. The planet doesn't care if geopolitics is a little bit tricky. So if we keep on pumping carbon into the atmosphere, that planet will keep on warming up. We've known this for decades. We can see inaction has consequences. So it is the mission of MEGA to create effective, equitable, and accountable global governance of the Earth system, serving the common good of humanity. Now we're here at a side event to the IPU, as Alan mentioned in his introduction, the Interparliamentary Union. Deliberating in pursuit of the common good is what parliamentarians do. This can be contrasted with what ambassadors do, which is to defend their local interests. That is the job of ambassadors. There's a famous quote about this from an 18th century British politician, Edmund Burke, pointing out the distinction between a parliament and a congress of ambassadors. And in my view, the absolutely key fundamental reform we need to make is giving parliamentarians a stronger voice in how we run the planet. My last point is that if you agree that we need to find a way to run our planet in the common interest, then please join us. To bring about the deep reform we need requires a powerful movement. And you can learn more and you can sign up on the website. So the website uh, is in the presentation. Have we got the presentation being shared with people? Sure. This, oh. Just putting our chair under pressure here. Perfect, thank you, Alan. So there's the website. Uh, if you Google uh, Mobilizing Earth Governance Alliance Mega, you'll find it. The URL is top right, earthgovernance.org. There you can find an information. There you can sign up and join us. Next slide, please. Okay, so very quickly, uh, talking to these slides, I've, I've already spoken to this. This is the structure of Mega. You have the Climate Governance Commission report that's informing Mega, which is building smart coalitions to implement the many. Uh, proposals and many campaigns which you can find online. Uh, there's a couple of them here, South Asia Global Environment Agency, Maya mentioned a couple. Next slide, please. The Smart Coalition Strategy, which seems to take a while to come through, there it is, coming in from the ether. Uh, this references a paper that was written on this by Boutler and Ponzio in 2015, 2016, um, about smart coalitions of state and non-state actors working together how they can actually impact the real world. Uh, so if you're interested in the detail, there's a paper there to look at. Next slide, please. All right, the next slide just points out what Mary Robinson said, what Maya reiterated, that root is not an environmental crisis, it's a global governance crisis, which is of our own humanity's making. Resolve this and we can unite to live in harmony with each other and with nature. And then finally, please work with us. Uh, you know, we need to come together as humanity to work together to resolve these global crises. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maya and John. It is a pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Ms. Margareta keener Nellen. Um, Ms. keener Nellen is a Swiss attorney, translator, and former Swiss politician. She served on the Swiss National Council between 20, 2003 and 2019. She is a board member of Parliamentarians for Nuclear Non- Proliferation and Disarmament. She is also a board member of the Peace Women Across the Globe <laughs> organization. And she has formerly been the head of the uh, Swiss delegation to the Interparliamentary Union. As Alan mentioned, we are here at the convocation of the annual IPU assembly and the chair of the uh, Committee on Democracy and Human Rights for the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe. Um, Ms. Keener Nella is joining us remotely. Um, and I give the floor to you, Margareta. Thank you. Thank you very much. I thank the organizers for inviting me as a speaker. As a former MP, let me first reflect on what MPs can do. 
And I would like to commend IPU for having done most remarkable contributions for increasing the percentage of youth and women in parliaments, as it is you, colleagues, MPs, who can and must use your positions to update your national legislation, to lay the basis in your national constitutions for your national courts to get the structures and competencies to judge on climate rights favorably. I'm sure Neshan will further elaborate on the international court structures. As a practicing attorney in Switzerland, let me draw your attention on a research project which is conducted at University of Zurich under the title CRRP. This reads Climate Rights and Remedies. I'm sure uh, Alan or me will put the link in the chat. This uh, research project, which is conducted um, under the guidance, under the leadership of former judge on the European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg, Helen Keller, also contains a climate litigation database, which I strongly recommend to you for reference. This database contains national, regional, and international case law related to human rights and climate change of about 60 countries. So please have a look at that. And I'm happy to give hope that there are more and more encouraging examples worldwide of court decisions on climate rights. Oh. I can only encourage you all to challenge the multinational companies on that, to challenge moreover and more so the huge armament production industry, which destroys the world with increasing warfare. Needless to say, and I think there is abundant literature on this in all languages, that climate and planet Earth cannot be safe, saved under capitalism. I will put in the chat the link to a publication on this in German. Last but not least, I would like to mention that Feminist peace organizations such as Peace Women Across the Globe, of which I am a board member, must challenge militarism and patriarchal structures. Actually, Mary Robinson was also alluding to that because it is masculinist ideals and practices which have destroyed part of the Earth's resources and which continue to do so at an alarming rhythm by inflaming war after war with endless armament supplies. And that's why I think in order to attract the world's public attention. What we need now is a global movement such as MEGA to address the issue of militarism, militarized economic and political organization of nations. I also think we need a global strike or at least some other form of nonviolent direct, direct action that will stop this business as usual. We must unequivocally take a feminist, ethical, political, and moral position on war, militarism, colonization, and occupation that are that is anti-racist, anti-colonial, anti-capitalist, and that 
unequivocally supports cultures of life for the survival of mankind and our planet. I wish MIGA with today's launch a great and urgently needed success and hope for future cooperation. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Margareta. Um, and thank you for reminding us that we are uh, across the road from the Interparliamentary Union Assembly um, and the important work that is done in the Interparliamentary Union Assembly on youth, climate, justice, peace issues, uh, and the importance of civil society engaging with their parliamentarians on these issues. Uh, and your openness to be very much part of that process. Thank you so much for that. Uh, it's now my honour to introduce Arthur Dahl, who's the President of the International Environment Forum. Um, he's previously held positions in the United Nations, and particularly the United Nations Environment Programme. He's held a number of uh, professional, professional roles at various universities, um, and advisory groups on international environment governance, and also been a consultant for the World Bank, the World Economic Forum, and other international organizations. So one of the world's expert, experts on governance mechanisms and the, their importance for the issues of today. Arthur, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. We have already had some very useful contributions on the different perspectives on this, this global issue that we're facing here. And if I could share a little of my own experience as a scientist specializing in coral reef systems, and as a young scientist, more than 50 years ago, I thought, you know, the world is changing. I should understand the, how nature is telling us to work together in Unity University. So I chose coral reefs as my specialization, and I set up long-term monitoring of coral reefs to see how they might change in the future. This is back in the late 1960s, early 1970s. Uh, I've been fighting this battle ever since. I was at the Stockholm Conference in 1972, bringing the Baha'i international community. Uh, you know, I was... I, I've, been, I've built a regional harbor program for all the Pacific Island countries. Uh, I've been you know, working the United States Department on managing the ocean, ocean areas around the world. But always, we've made progress on one side, but we always have never overcome the resistance on the other side in the issue of governance today. We had the, the Rio Earth Summit in 1992. I was in the Secretariat at Rio de Janeiro 21. And uh, we adopted the conventions on climate change and biodiversity on certification. Uh, and they've made a lot of progress, but we've still not turned the corner. After more than 50 years of being aware of the problems and knowing what we ought to be to do to resolve them, we still have to face this, we might say, what's wrong with our human system. We know that we have to manage the global environment as a whole today. We can no longer just look at, at climate here, biodiversity there. It's all interrelated. Everything is affecting everything else. So we need to have a much more comprehensive climate mechanism as called for by the Climate Governance Commission. But we also have to say, our big failures are in the limits of human governance. And that's because we have, on the one hand, we have all of this work building a system for the future. We have the United Nations, but it's always falling short because the, the, the forces working against it in the economy, you know, in the political realm, you know, we see it with the wars, we see it with the destruction of the environment because it's the corporations who only have the value of greed and growth and are not looking at all the human well being or the future. Uh, that are taking us in the wrong direction. So how do we overcome this, this massive resistance? And that's where we need this kind of a coming together in, a, in mobilizing and growing alliance, get enough voices across all of the world, across all the different spheres of human activity to try to resist these forces of destruction that are still powerfully taking us in the wrong direction today. And I think that's where coming together on this, we need, as I mentioned, to bring the science to the center because science is practical, it's realistic, you know, you, you can't really, you can't play politics with the science because it will go on and destroy things anyway if we neglect, neglect what the planet is doing. So we have to bring science much more closely into the government's process. But I just read this morning, for instance, that the, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change is only half funded for the next two years. So even our best our mechanisms are falling short because governments are not willing to pay. It's still voluntary. Who will contribute a little bit here and there? There's no international taxation for the environment. There's no international legislation that can be applied to the corporations, to the to everybody. We have this enormous gap in governance at the global level, and we're running short of time because the planet is taking us in the wrong direction very quickly. So only by mobilizing together, creating 
of course, among all the, the, the potential positive interests building a better future, we have a chance to resist these negative impulses that are still taking us in the wrong direction. So I hope you will all join in, in MEGA. We need to work together. Maybe we can make a breakthrough. Perhaps it'll be a climate catastrophe that will finally wake up the system enough to say, we can't go on in this way any longer. We have to begin to put something in place to make it work differently. And by putting these ideas on the table now with MEGA, with the Work on the Governance Commission, we have the blueprint is there. We know what needs to be done, but it's going to have united forces around the world that we need to come together in order to try to solve the problem and save the world for us and for future generations. Thank you. Thank you so much, Arthur. And before introducing our, our next speaker, I would remind everyone that we do have the question and answer function. We have a couple comments and questions coming through that way. Um, we also will have the ability for those who wish to take the floor um, verbally who are joining us online to do so when we reach the discussion portion of our program. Uh, so now it is my utmost pleasure to introduce my friend and colleague, Neshan Gunisakera, who is an international lawyer, educationalist, leadership post, facilitator, and environmentalist from Sri Lanka. He is committed to bringing communities together for environmental protection, healing, and conservation through the use of intergenerational, holistic, and experiential learning. He is currently a visiting fellow at the Raoul Longberg Institute for Human Rights and Human Law in Bund, Sweden. Um, I, I could go on with his bio, but I would like you to hear from the man himself. Neshan, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Rebecca, for the kind introduction. And then I go on, Warakam, Assalamu Alaikum, and go with the Mida, and good afternoon. So, those friends uh, who are in the room but also joining us uh, online, I'm glad that Alan started off by bringing the blessings of the mountains that are surrounded by uh, in the room that we're in. I think the mountains are watching us very carefully on how we manage what's seen as earth resources. And uh, not uh, to repeat what was said before, I'm fully endorsing all the wonderful experts who spoke uh, and, and the effort that they're taking. But what two dimensions I wanted to kind of highlight was one, earth, the other on the side, trust. And I'll start with the latter first. I think that the trust deficit created by humans not cooperating with each other or with the resource of uh, has led to a trust deficit that has led to over 100 plus conflicts uh, that is weaponizing the whole planet. And we're also weaponizing the young generation to try to fight these issues. And we are passing on to them a burden uh, which violates the basic human rights and necessities. And the earth, we've also lost to a large extent with the industrial model that we put to ourselves over the last 400 years, the world of indigenous knowledge systems, which actually informs all the scientific knowledge that we have, because it is the natural environment that uh, allows us to do everything that we are doing in the human life. And I think that we have to be very humble that the waters of the mountains is what nourishes us. And it is not the human, it is one species that controls or dominates the environment. And I think those two aspects of earth and trust uh, is something that we really need to bring in through a normative framework, building on the indigenous wisdom. And here I want to share a few examples. And, you know, great honor, Arthur, to hear you speak and the wonderful work you've done over the last 60, 70 years. And uh, I'm a bit younger to you, and I hope uh, that the, the generation who's not represented here today is the future generations. And I do not have the right to speak on behalf of generations yet unborn, but I will attempt to share that we have borrowed Earth from generations yet to come. And we should not ever forget that. We do not have access to the resources to do what we want, to exploit the natural resources, to build weapons and bombs to destroy the planet several times over. Here, in the late 1990s, a wonderful group of elders who are also connected to this group was involved in drafting and formulating something called the Earth Charter, which brought together indigenous wisdom from across the world, trying to build up uh, the wisdom of what Alan mentioned initially on Kaitia Kitanga, which is the Maori spiritual wisdom of our interconnectedness with the planet Earth at a psychological and metaphysical level. Or the Inuit wisdom on Sheila, which also talks about 
our role and our responsibilities. For example, the trees breathe and therefore human ability to live because if you don't have oxygen, I don't think we'll be any ground for people. I think we have to be humble in this approach as we attempt to be coalition. I think we have to build on the tools we have. And here I want to mention the wonderful uh, legacy of uh, Earth citizen, late Judge Christopher Vera Mumphrey, who was a former vice president of the International Court of Justice. And over 25 years ago, a quarter of a century, he took the concept of sustainable development, uh, which uh, was embodied in the Bantland Commission of 1987. And he translated into core principles of international environmental law. And in a very important case on Gabchikovo and Nagimoros, which came before the International Court of Justice in 1997, a case contested between Hungary and Slovakia, so Viramant wrote his separate opinion in which he went into the wisdom of indigenous systems and religions and cultures and interpreted the first principles of international environmental law uh, called principles of trustation. And many, many generations after he's considered as one of the pioneering persons for international environment. And that, I think, is my last point. And I uh, am thankful for Margareta for kindly pointing in our direction uh, an advisory opinion before the International Court of Justice at the moment, which looks at the climate change issue. And I believe uh, Yule was not able to join us because she's unwell, part of the World Youth for Climate Justice, inspired by young people from the Pacific Island, has brought possibly the most important case before the highest United Nations judicial organ on the issue of climate change. And this possibly is the most important case this century. And this is what we need to learn from the social environmental movements. Young people are really taking up action. But we need to join with them and bring about these changes. And finally, just to show the idealism uh, in which uh, a trusteeship is built, uh, goes back to a declaration of The Hague, which is adopted in 2018, uh, championed by Professor Klaus Bosselman and a wider group of experts working on bridging indigenous wisdom with law and responsibilities for human rights. And I think that's what we need to recognize that without human responsibilities, we will not realize human rights. And a little bit of wisdom from Rumi, uh, who's a, a favorite poet of mine, uh, as we build on a coalition uh, to, to tread lightly on the earth. Uh, Rumi said this about uh, different wisdoms available to us. He said, the lamps are many, but the light is the same. I'm looking forward to our journey on the trust issue. Okay. And as Alan introduces um, our last speaker, um, we have seen the requests for the recording of this program that will be sent to all registrants, including those who are unable to join or only joining for part of the program today. You already have the PowerPoint slides in the chat, but those will also be shared after the fact if you are unable to download very quickly. Well, thank you very much, Rebecca. And thank you, Nisham, particularly for two aspects that you mentioned. That this is the trusteeship principles, which you've identified are not new that there are examples of those, but not only in Indigenous law, some of them are also being now brought into other law. So my own country, for example, has been bringing in a, a number of these principles of trusteeship from Maori law into our national law, including, for example, the declaration of certain environmental systems and entities as living persons. That's now in our legislation. Uh, the Whangarui River, uh, the Mount Taranaki, and the Uruera Forest are all determined as living persons which is taking the principles which Maya was talking about and also Arthur, that we need to deal with these things as holistic systems. And that's where MEGA is so important because it's looking at interrelationships between the systems and governance that can help address the fact that we are an in integrated earth system that has many critical challenges and stress points, but we need to work on those together. So that was a really good introduction there. And particularly for mentioning World Youth for Climate Justice, and Yuli did give her apologies. She was going to be one of the co-moderators today, but fell sick. The incredible achievement that they've got getting this critical issue of climate change into the International Court of Justice. What are the responsibilities of states? Uh, taken to the court unanimously by the UN General Assembly, and the court, International Court of Justice, has the mandate to look at all sources of international law that are applicable to this issue, not just the Framework Convention, which is very limited, but customary law, 
principles of international law, the teachings of highly esteemed jurists and professors uh, and precedent. So we need to watch this case very carefully and be engaged with it and be really appreciative that the youth have brought this to a place where we will be able to get these principles affirmed at the, high, the world's highest legal body. So that was a, law, a little bit on the law side, which I share is such an important part of this. Uh, we've talked a lot about parliamentarians. Now our last speaker is actually going to talk about the importance of private sector and engaging with that. And we're really happy to have with us Alexander Schmidt, who's the Head of Science, Sustainability and Climate Research in Normative, which is the carbon accounting platform engine, working very much with the private sector, but to help with the interaction between the private sector policymakers, scientists. So, Alexander, we look forward to your comments. Thank you so much, Alan, for the kind intro, and um, thank you all for having me here today. I'm really excited about this project, um, and you were mentioning it a bit before. The first time I heard about it when I met actually John at COP and last year in Dubai was when I really was excited about the opportunity that we're facing here with this collision, with this, with this project. And we've heard before from other speakers around what I would consider being the planetary imperative uh, that we're all facing. Uh, we look out at the mountains and we see the ice getting less and less every year. I share your passion for climbing, John. So uh, that is always a pain in the outside. And we realize how we just destroy, unfortunately, nature with our actions, uh, intentionally or not. Uh, we heard about the regulatory imperative to act, that we need more. We need to come together. We need to unite our policies, etc. And there's a third one that I want to highlight today that is about the competitive imperative, the, the, the private sector landscape. Once more, reference to COP and to commitments we have seen around the world from businesses to go to usually what we call the net zero, so a state in which they on net total don't contribute anymore with activities to global warming or to pollution as such. We see these patches going up and up and up and nothing else happens. <laughs> And that is right now, I hope, the void we can fill with this initiative. We need to see how we can help businesses to translate voluntary action into or voluntary commitments into real world action. And I see this as interplay. On one side, businesses need help and guidance. And honestly, this often comes through regulations. Yes, we have many, many businesses who take voluntary steps to commit but also many, to be honest, are only pushed by the stick and not pulled by anything else. So we need to come together to help them, to nudge them, to really have a comprehensive framework. On the other side, businesses need to implement the regulations that policymakers are setting. So we need to communicate with them. We cannot just put out regulation and mandates without taking into account the business reality that many companies, especially medium or smaller size companies are facing right now. So facilitating this dialogue, bridging the gap between what you just said and then before, the business side, the policy side, and the academia side, where I'm coming from. This is so, so crucial. And I think it's a, it's a huge opportunity. We heard the quote before from breakdown or breakthrough. This comes back to what was mentioned also in the report we're referring throughout this, this launch event here around a crossroads moment, something we hear again and again today, we are at this crossroads moment, not just businesses and politics as individuals, but globally, humanity, it is the breakthrough or breakdown moment that we are facing. So anything we can do to pull everything together that we have, because ultimately it is about well-being, often as you I think said, it is about accounting not just for profit and losses, but for well-being overall, which was the idea behind metric of GDP in the first place. So how can we do this better, together, more aligned? And I'm excited to throw everything I have, we have into this to make this really a global success. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alexander. I'm now going to pass over to Rebecca, who's mm -hmm. going to be facilitating questions and answers. We've got some coming from online already, and we'll also entertain some from around the table. Thank you very much, Alan. So we do already have some rich discussion um, in the Q&A function, and I see one individual who's raised their hand. We'll come to you in a moment, sir. 
Um, and I also invite those in the room to raise your physical hands or just say hello, and we would like to continue the discussion here as well. So having just heard from Alexander um, very eloquently about the important role the private sector can play, I'd like to start with a question that considers um, a uh, what we often don't think is a sectoral interest, but the interest of individuals. So we have a question coming to us from David uh, Levi. I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing your surname. Um, that you wonder what role you can anticipate for citizens to take part in multilateral fora beyond civil society organizations. So if any of our speakers would like to, to speak to that, I'm just going to um, uh, give you one more to, uh, to ruminate on as you contemplate the answers to, to that, um, which is we had a couple of uh, congratulations and sincere appreciations for um, Ms. Keener Nellen's statements about the root causes of environmental degradation and destruction. And so we have a couple of questions about what can be done um, to reevaluate and uh, shift global norms um, and such insidious um, practices and residual effects of colonialism, um, uh, geopolitical structures uh, that favor the global north capitalism um, and all manner of other ills. And this was said far more articulately in the, the Q&A function that you can all see by Ms. Alexandra Gavilano. Um, so I give you those two questions to start us off. And then um, I will come as well to several others that are in the Q&A function and those who have hands raised online or in person. Okay. Uh Thank you, Alan. Uh, thank you for the question. I'll, I'll talk to the question of what the uh, what the what the individual can do. Uh, so I guess the core insight of Mega to me is that this is not at heart an environment problem; it's a governance problem. So I'm all in favour of individuals doing the right thing and being vegan and flying less and sailing across the ocean and whatever it may be. But in my somewhat cynical view, and I used to work in the finance industry, I have lots of friends who still work in the finance industry, we should not put the future of our planet and humanity into the hands of the morality of individuals, because they're not all that selfless, which is why it's a government issue. And then if you go and talk to politicians, they tell you they, they know what needs to be done. It's a classic thing. They know what needs to be done, but they don't know how to get re-elected after they've done it. And so, in my view, the best thing you can do as an individual is to talk to the politicians, vote for the politicians that are aligned with what we're thinking, talk to your friends, work with people you know, work with your networks, build individual support, get people on the streets. One of the things Mega is going to be doing is reaching out to the environment movement uh, to talk to them about perceiving this as fundamentally a governance issue. Once people are demanding reforms to global governance, then politicians have the license to act. At the moment, it's very difficult for politicians to act on that. So that would be my, my key advice. Would be because something that occurs to me in having this conversation now during this launch, uh, unprepared comment, I don't think uh, we have facility for individuals to sign up to Mega at the moment. That is maybe something we should be thinking about. Yeah, thank you for those great questions, everyone. And uh, yeah, just echoing uh, John's thought that uh, we should definitely establish a facility where individuals can uh, join MEGA in their capacity as individuals. And we should also consider partnering partnering with some, some different platforms that have sort of individual petitions, et cetera, as part of our, our campaigning. Um, and also another idea would be following on, on John's thought that we really need to have the dialogue with decision makers at all levels of governance to support them, to do the thought leadership, to emphasize how important this is and how, how uh, citizens uh, are demanding bold action and uh, will be there urging them on and also <laughs> helping to you know um, have also cross-partisan kind of uh, support and pressure for the different policy and governance transformations we need. Um, and just quickly, there are some, some questions about uh, what can we do to shift, you know, the, the, the global norms. 
uh, as John had mentioned earlier, smart coalitions have, have been very successful, in fact, for uh, um, over the last three decades or so, um, uh, succeeding in, in bringing into effect really dramatic transformations in the international system, like the adoption of the International Criminal Court, like the Landmines Treaty, the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, et cetera. There's, there's a, a whole host of examples where uh, groups of dedicated uh, citizens, civil society groups, like-minded states, professionals, business community also uh, have, have made uh, dramatic uh, changes. And, and so we're really trying to learn from those and how we can be very strategic and focused at this crossroads in the interests of the international community for some of the key governance reforms we have, we, 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 we know that we must uh, make in line with, with science. <laughs> science will not wait for uh, the, 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 the biophysical systems. They have their own uh, logic that we need to understand and respond, respond to in our, in our own collective interest. And just a few uh, on the sort of residual colonial dynamics and economics around the world, we've had um, uh, uh, a lot of in intensive conversations in the Climate Governance Commission with our, because we have really participants from around the world and experts, and we've had some very in-depth conversations uh, on these issues. You know, how do we recover from uh, the residual colonialism as, as, as someone mentioned in the chat? And uh, I think we're, you know, we had a lot of meeting of the minds in terms of different steps. We have some economic proposals and perspectives in, in the Climate Governance Commission report. And we will also be working on those for your information. We have a wonderful uh, economic think tank partner in New York City, Institute of New Economic Thinking. They have a global uh, youth uh, scholars network of, of economists, young economists who want to indeed think in these transformative ways for well -being, the well-being economy, as Alexander mentioned. So I think there's, there's huge potential to actually like, find solutions as a united international community and indeed to transcend and recover from uh, you know, the, the greed-based, uh, the colonial kind of dynamics. So um, we'll be in touch uh, on that front too. And we hope that these, this Young Scholars Network of INET can help uh, to spearhead and take for, forward a lot of these uh, also bold international economic governance uh, proposals. Uh, so we'll be working very closely with them. Thank you very much, Maya. And I'll just add for individual involvement in MEGA, you can go on our webpage, earthgovernance.org. There is a section there called Get Involved. And in Get Involved, there's Take Action. So we have a number of the appeals that are supporting various of the proposals or campaigns uh, that MEGA is, is including uh, in the platform. There's also subscribe to the newsletter so you can get updates of what are mega activities, what are some of the um, key proposals and traction that's building on those. Um, there's also join as an organization, if your organization is interested in joining. Um, and there's also donate, if you'd like to help uh, give some funding to support the proposal. So there are those ways that individuals can get involved at the moment. Thank you. And I think Rebecca's got the comment too. Yes. Um, so on that note, we have some excellent suggestions and potential campaign ideas that have been included in the Q&A function. And I'll, um, I'll send you out our friend Arthur Kennegis with his proposal um, for a smart gov app that would enable people of the earth to interactively begin to govern the world. These are the kind of ideas that this laboratory is here to foster and to grow. We hope to be an incubator for all of these wonderful proposals and both inside and outside of our solutions. Um, I think maybe some of our speakers want to, would like to address what's already been um, put to the table, but I'll lay on a few other elements that are coming up in the chat. Um, first, on a philosophical level, um, what can be done to engender trust and altruism as bedrock principles that must undergird any successful um, uh, or productive global governance order, including for Earth governance. And then secondly, we have some um, quite um, uh, more practical questions about um, carbon taxes um, and um, level, uh, potential global levy on fossil fuels to fund loss and damage carbon taxes, particularly uh, for the armament industry. So if any of our panelists would like to reflect on those very specific proposals or the general philosophical question that's been posed, uh, please, the floor is yours. Uh, I was happy to leap in to answer questions, I guess. 
So, I mean, what's one of the things on the, on the building the trust and bringing people together? Uh, this is something Maya can speak to, but uh, she has been talking to a media company about doing uh, outreach to the into faith, into belief, sort of common values uh, community. Uh, so, the governance we're talking about is underpinned by common human values as captured in you know, the Declaration of Human Rights. So, people do have common values. And bringing people together around, I was talking to someone about this yesterday, you bring people together around values, and from there you can, you can build the action you need to take together. Uh, so, so that's one aspect of it. In terms of a carbon tax, I mean, I, you know, I, I love the idea of a carbon tax and economists have been advocating it for decades. And the difficulty in implementing a carbon tax is that to work well, it would need to be a global carbon tax and we don't have very strong global governance. And if you look at it at the national level, well, no nation wants to move first, it puts a bit of a competitive disadvantage. And now we have the European border adjustment mechanism, so there are attempts to do this. But the fact we haven't implemented a carbon tax 30 years ago just highlights that global governance isn't very effective. I mean, you have the issue, to my mind, with the, the private sector, which is globalized very well, very efficient, and, uh, and regulation has not globalized alongside. So if you work for a corporate, as I did, then your job fundamentally in current structure is to make money for your shareholders and to comply with the rules and the laws. But if you can work your way between all the different national jurisdictions and make more profits, well, that's what you're mandated to do. So given that the private sector has globalized, it is necessary, in my view, for governance to globalize, to manage global business. Thanks, John. I think Alexander wants to add yes. a few comments. Just, just quickly adding on to what John just said. And finally, I think we can we can combine the aspect of trust, altruism, and the carbon tax in this way. Mm. It's about incentive structure. You mentioned also before the reality of us humans not always acting in the most altruistic way that exists, at least if we believe by our own community. We all have this community, however we want to define it, is if it's our tribe, if it's our whatever community we identify with. So trust and altruism breaks down after a certain size. I think it's about 150, 80 people or something, which you just can't grasp anymore, evolutionary. So incentives needs to come in there. Incentives need to come in to motivate, to generate this trust, to avoid this prisoner dilemma where you are, where you might have an advantage of deviating from the optimal solutions. And also uh, incentives come in when you talk about something like carbon taxation. Uh, what is my incentive to actually impose an internal carbon tax? We see it with some of our companies we work with. They are willing to do that, but it's right now voluntary. They justify budgeting based on internal carbon tax, but honestly, it's quite arbitrarily set right now. And sometimes it's, it's also way too low still. It doesn't account for the full impact of the carbon, so they still do not pay the full cost. They outsource the cost to other unfortunate uh, players of the of the ecosystem. So I would say incentives structure and then coming back to global governance, because only from a global level then we can set an aligned incentive structure across regions, industries, and actors. Thank you. Did Margareta want to comment? Um, Margareta, um, I've asked you in the chat function if you would like to come in on any of these questions, but perhaps particularly on the question of, of, of taxation on armaments. Um, I don't want to put you on the spot. Um, that's exactly what I'm doing. I think yes. Yes, yes thank you. you. Yes, we can. Thank you very much, Margareta. Thank you. Well, thank you for the question. Maybe briefly two, three um, reflections. Whoever pronounces climate and engages for climate protection, which MIGA does, and we all do, must in the same sentence say peace. And peace means disarmament. Peace means put away the arms. And I am quoting the recent speeches of Pope Francis from Argentina who is very consistent on this message. And this is not only Pope Francis from Argentina, um, who was 
heavily criticized, at least here in Europe, for having taken this stance recently and also in his Christmas address. I am saying this as a Protestant Christian person. Um, the Holy See, for instance, as other pacifist movements have had this stand since the end of World War II. But now, and this is my second thought on this, this um, apocalypse, the ap ap please help me, apocalypse, apocalypse, we are at this moment living with what with which is happening in Gaza. Big majority of citizens of this world, from Asia through all other continents, and yesterday and the day before we heard it heavily, rightly, in the IPU assembly in Geneva, have lost trust in institutions. And as there is no, today, we all, all agree on that, of course, as there is no political will of any leaders of bigger nations, of heavily armed nations, of the nations that produce the most arms, uh, please refer to the CIPRI statistics, to the latest CIPRI statistics on the 100 biggest producers of arms, and therefore the 100 biggest polluters of this earth. There is no will, so we have to tame this huge kangaroo down of the armament protection. And therefore, um, ideas such as taxing heavily um, on armament production, of course, we should do this and introduce this right away. And we have to make transparent um, who are the major stockholders of uh, the armament companies. It's not only states, it's also investment companies such as BlackRock. Uh, yes, and maybe one thought that came to me uh, to wrap up on this, one thought that has come to me during our today's discussion. Um, I heard Mary Robinson say, if I quote her rightly, otherwise correct me, please. I noted from her speech, uh, her saying that a green revolution may not be enough. I agree very much. I was thinking we had in 1789, the French Revolution, which brought up the rights of the, in which the rights of the individual person to a number of freedoms, which we have now in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, etc. Uh, we had in October 1917 the uh, re social revolution in St. Petersburg, which brought about uh, rights for the workers and social movements, communist movements. And it's time now for a very basic revolution. I touched on this in my previous presentation today, which must reform society and which must install the, an opposite system to the prevailing capitalist system in almost all the Northern Hemisphere, which favors quality and the dignity of individuals and um, a good life for all and the safeguards for Earth, Earth and the planet. Thank you. Thank you very much, Margareta. I know that in the Swiss Parliament, you and other of your colleagues have taken a step in this direction with the Swiss War Materials Act of 2013, which prohibits the funding uh, of illegal weapons. I know you're going much beyond that and saying we should look at stopping the funding of all weapons. But this was a start. I know it's led to the Swiss pension funds ending their investments in various of the weapons systems, including nuclear weapons, for example. Uh, so, that, but I, 
see also that we've got um, Cyril is wanting to make a comment. We've got a couple of questions on legal aspects, which we'll come to here and then swing over to Nisha. And I think we'll come on to there. And then we'll see if there's any, any other comments from the table. Uh, Cyril. Thank you, Lauren. Um, I want to say I have enjoyed to thank every one of the speakers for being a very inspiring set of comments. I just want to pick up one single one of them to tell you the train of thought that one sentence from Arthur sparked in me, who said, after so many years, of being aware of the problems. Where's the result? Yeah. Also, after so many years of solutions being put on the table time after time, UN reports and reports even that have not left a library shelf for decades. Uh, Butrus Galli's agenda for peace in his day, that was its game changer, and thank you for recalling the Earth Charter. That, you know, we just need to implement it. <laughs> so, where is the gap? We also have an avalanche of scientific reports that tell us, A, the issue, and B, what to do about it. And that uh, perhaps gives the answer to my own question, where's the blockage? You know that the President of the General Assembly has what he or UN calls town halls with civil society both, and it's not, they've, been, they've transmitted this town hall concept to Geneva and to Vienna as well as New York. And after the President of the General Assembly addresses um, 200 uh, NGOs, um, a representative of the conference of UN NGOs, which I am, is usually allowed to pose the first question. So the last uh, uh, but one, I said to the President of the General Assembly, who was telling us exactly like today that there are many problems to be solved and we want to do something about it. Well, okay. So I said, well, what about the uh, decision-making on UN declarations or whatever, being more based on the scientific evidence that you have in front of you from all these reports. To which the President of the General Assembly, almost without hesitating, said, well, you know, scientists are not decision-makers, we're the decision-makers. Oh my God, I thought that's, you. thank you for illustrating the problem. How do we get round this, apart from mobilization, we all have to stand up and speak up on this, but if there are other, a majority of politicians who think that it doesn't really matter if they don't listen to scientists because scientists are not the decision makers, here we have a central, a core, a core issue about global governance. I put that on the table. Thank you, Cyril. I'm swinging back to Rebecca, who's got a couple of comments or questions on the law side mm -hmm. of things. And then we'll come to you, Nisha, and then to Maya. Thank you. So there was a um, very moving question uh, and slash comment in the chat about the perceived crisis of international law exemplified by the many conflicts raging in the world, including in the Middle East, inter alia, um, and what international law can be token uh, in terms of environmental justice. And I'll start actually, if you'll indulge me for a moment to use co-moderator's privilege, um, by reading a quote to you um, about an international law professor, such as I think um, made the comment in the chat. Uh, Never has such profound skepticism been sensed about the legitimacy and usefulness of the discipline he teaches. Hasn't the appalling conflict unfolding before our eyes demonstrated with tremendous eloquence the vanity, or at least the extreme fragility of a so-called legal order in relations between states? might think that this was a contemporary comment on the state of the world that we're looking at today, but it was actually written in 1914, just a few weeks after the invasion of Belgium uh, by Germany. So let's just say that the crises over international law are never new, but perhaps an existential facet of the system. At the same time, 
to begin to answer the question and then go to um, much superior expertise than, than mine, we see a proliferation of mechanisms for different kinds of environmental justice. We, uh, I think, cited in the chat was the independent expert um, recommendation that ecocide be included as an independent crime under the Rome statute, thus rendering it able to, uh, thus rendering independent personal jurisdiction over um, uh, the, the crime of ecocide uh, be possible. Um, it is also already a war crime and a crime against humanity envisioned by the Rome statute and the current prosecutor has reaffirmed his intent to fully utilize um, that mechanism to bring perpetrators to justice under the existing crimes within its jurisdiction. And I think I'll pass to my colleagues shortly to talk about the, um, the unprecedented case currently before the International Court of Justice, which is seized of a request for an advisory opinion on the obligation of states with regards to uh, their, their um, uh, culpability in climate change. Um, at the same time, two of the proposals that we'll see on the mega website um, are for uh, new courts um, and tribunals, including an independent climate court and also in including an in uh, international anti-corruption court with, where we know that the uh, scourge of brand corruption is so uh, often linked to uh, environmental destruction. So with that, I'll pass it, I think, to my friend, Nesha, to take over. Sure, uh, I thought Rebecca would continue and answer all the questions. <laughs> She's more competent than uh, most of us, but then just to add to what uh, Rebecca said and to kind of reflect on what, um, you know, Cyril uh, and uh, Alex and others have also said. So the International Court of Justice advisory opinion on climate change, as I said, is possibly once in a century case not because of the only utility of the International Court of Justice as uh, an uh, institution uh, that uh, was set up through a process going back to 1899 over the first PSA conference was constituted, but how over 2,000 climate litigation cases are going on at every level, whether it's regional, international, and national. And there was a question earlier on about what individuals can do, and I think whilst there is a change which is going to happen with or without human intervention, we're trying to build a coalition around how we should uh, play a positive role in this. Uh, nature will continue to play its role. And I think that's where we need to really unlearn most of the systems. And that's where education becomes a power of two. And in Sri Lanka, we had a program for training for trusteeship, which builds on the scientific evidence of people like Professor Hans Peter Doer, who was the foremost nuclear physicist of the last century of the last generation who fought against the nuclear industry all throughout his life. We need to know that at the individual level, we can bring that change and possibly at the both the political processes as well as the judicial processes at that level. But the ICJ case is symbolic because as Alan said, all the countries on the planet are agreed on this. So what is then the accountability? And I think that's something we need to look at, whether it leads to ecocide or crimes against current and future generations, which are already in existing jurisprudence or in case law. It's not only about having a new law defined, it's utilizing, and Margareta referred to Pope, goes back to the history of 13th century on St. Francis of Assisi and the Assisi declarations of 1986, which embodies the customary principles which infuses international law. So I think there's so many examples, but at, at individual level, when a group of young people led by one professor of law changed the world by taking a case from the Pacific Island states to the International Court of Justice, getting the whole UN to agree, that's enough inspiration, I think, to really be learned. And I would know that all of these um, both existing and new global institutions are, of course, complementary to uh, domestic and regional jurisdictions. Um, and the, the good ideas and the good jurisprudence percolates up and it trickles down. Now, we've had um, some hands raised for quite some time. Thank you for your patience. Uh, and then I think we have um, another intervention from the floor here. Uh, I'm going to ask you um, if you would like to, to take the floor. Um, my colleague is going to spotlight you, so I'm going to go first to Tom Cuthbert, and then Nick Dunlop, and then Arthur Kanigas um, in that order. Um, so Tom, I think you now have the ability to be a speaker. Hello, and hello uh, to you in Geneva. Can you hear me? Very loud and clear. Okay, well, uh, sorry, uh, I'm speaking from not so great Britain, and my question really is a point from Mary Robinson, 
who seemed to raise uh, a point about the tension between national interests and global visions. And for me, this comes down to a, a kind of key phrase about the concept of human security. I've watched endless debates in Parliament about security, and it always becomes militarised, even if you're a Labour Party supporter or a Conservative Party supporter. And this seems to be a basic mistake in our thinking about security in this country. So would you care to um, comment on what I call a triumph of denial and ignorance in, in our not-so-great Britain, and how can we, if you like, educate people about the nature of human security and demilitarize that conversation? Thank you so much, Tom. And I think your, your um, question also links to another comment in the chat, also from the UK and also from another Thomas, um, uh, regarding the term or uh, the idea of securinomics and asking about the intersectionality between environmental uh, governance and ecological and human security. Um, I'll take the next question uh, or comment from Nick Dunlop before we go to uh, our panelists for responses. Uh, Nick and then Arthur and then uh, our panelists remarks. So can you hear me? It's, I, yes, yes I can. I don't seem to have the usual sort of microphone thing on my screen, but I guess you're operating that. Um, Yes, so so uh, I, I've been listening for the last few minutes with great interest and uh, uh, various themes have been touched on, like political will, international taxation, um, that lead back, among other places, to the parliaments. So I, I was just going to say a word about the role of parliamentarians, which I think we need to keep underlining, and I know you, Rebecca, have worked in, in the international parliamentary network space, as has Alan for a long time. Uh, Alan suggested that maybe I should just briefly say something about the climate parliament, so I'm happy to do that, um, uh, and I'll keep an eye on, on, on time, so I don't take up too much. But, but um, the climate parliament is one of the uh, uh, the organizations, one of the countless organizations involved in MEGA. Um, and uh, uh, it's, it's not a, a globally representative body like the Interparliamentary Union. It's, it's, a, 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 it's a global parliament of climate champions in the different national parliaments. Um, so that means the small number in each parliament who uh, uh, actually care about protecting the planet, worry about climate change, or those that we think could be turned into climate champions. Um, and everyone who's been involved in parliamentary work around the table I'm looking at, I, I'm sure will agree that it would always be a mistake to underestimate what a small number of committed parliamentarians can make happen in their country. Um, there's uh, a, a, an achievement section on our Climate Parliament website that describes a few of our successes, which include um, increasing budgets, in some cases by hundreds of millions of dollars a year or even billions in the case of the EU budget for renewable energy. We, we played a key role in doubling India's renewable energy budget um, uh, over a space of three years, we protected a few billion euros extra in the EU budget for cross-border grid connections, which are essential for the transition to renewable energy. We've uh, uh, managed to help get new climate legislation through in various places, most recently in Uganda and Nigeria. Uh, we've used the parliamentary diplomacy role of parliamentarians to put together international initiatives like the Green Grids initiative that was launched a few years ago at the Glasgow Climate Summit uh, with the launch led by Prime Minister Modi of India. Um, and uh, he was joined by ministers from the United States, France, Australia, Nigeria, prime ministers of the UK and Samoa. Um, so, you know, we're able to put together high level new initiatives. What we're, what we're aiming to do is to increase the role of parliamentarians in climate action and environmental governance, both at the national level and at the international level. So 
uh, part, part of the original vision uh, uh, from the very start has, has, has always been that the very, as the very name suggests, we, by, by, by creating a kind of global body of parliamentary climate champions, we can help the individual legislators to do more than, than they would or could do just on their own. And finally, let me just say, we're, we're focusing right now on climate finance as a way in. This is a key role for parliamentarians. You know, one of their jobs is to keep an eye on the money. Uh, and there's already billions of dollars flowing from organizations like the Green Climate Fund and the Global Environment Facility. There needs to be, and I'm sure there will eventually be a lot more in the future. Um, and we're we're building a role for parliamentarians by by creating a collaboration with those two agencies, among others. Um, and uh, uh, we're starting off with the Green Climate Fund with a partnership where we we brought in fifteen African governments, um, where our role will be to help the parliamentarians to make their countries attractive to green investment. With a, with a focus on creating green investment development zones, grids for short, ending with a Z rather than a S, uh, where, where, where we can try to get multilateral agencies providing investment guarantees to help reduce the risk for investors to bring in as much investment as possible, not only into solar and wind generate uh, generating capacity, but green industries that energy hungry like green hydrogen green steel green cement green uh, fertilizer and so on um, and the idea is to to create a kind of a model that could be scaled up and 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 taken up uh, uh, all over the world for kind of creating more and more green investment zones um so that's that's uh uh, I've been timing myself here. That's five minutes, and that's quite enough for me. Unless anyone <laughs> has anything further to say uh, uh, about uh, uh, the role of parliamentarians or the the political side of this challenge that we're coming together to address. Thank you so much, Nick. And and on the subject of time, um, I am chagrined that we are here in Switzerland. Um, and as timekeeper, I'm perhaps falling down in my duty a little bit. We are five, six minutes over. We'll go next to, to Arthur, then the one intervention room. Unfortunately, we will not have time to explore the robust panoply of questions and comments that are in the chat, but I will just highlight a few. And I encourage all of you who are making these interventions uh, to be in touch about submitting them as proposals or campaigns for the MEGA initiative, this is precisely what MEGA is here for. These include empowering those who are most affected by the, the current system's failures, um, who are most vulnerable in all sorts of ways from refugees to human rights defenders. We had some questions on culpabilities for, for nuclear uh, damage uh, and nuclear responsibility. Um, we had some further comments on uh, debt. We had reflections on intersectionality from a number of angles, including health, um, as well as we talked a little bit about security and peace policy. And we also had some proposals for education um, starting at a young age, linking all of these issues with environmental governance. So I'll go now to Arthur and then our last comment from the room, and then maybe just one minute final uh, reflections from each of our speakers. Arthur, over to you. Thank you so much. This is amazing. I'm just thrilled to have, uh, with, can you hear me okay? Great, Arthur. You can hear me? Yeah, you hear yes. me. Okay. Yes, I'm, I'm just thrilled uh, uh, with Mega and with all the comments here and the fantastic work uh, you're doing to involve this crucially uh, essential governance for the planet. Uh, and as you know, I'm, uh, uh, pres I'm president of Future Wave and the director of the movie, The World is My Country, about world citizen number one, Gary Davis. And we've had many of you on our People Powered Planet podcast, and love to have some more, uh, where we talk about how we can actually evolve the kind of system that Gary was talking about. Uh, one of the things that Gary said is, you know, and as has been mentioned here, for years we've had fantastic proposals, but we're trying to beg and plead the government leaders uh, to make peace when all the constitutions and the Universal Declaration of Independent uh, of Human Rights uh, say that the will of the people is the basics, basis of governance. And so Gary said, well, we're the people. Why don't we, the people, just go ahead and create world governance? And 
he was proposing as the internet evolved, he was very excited to see how uh, how an app like you know two friends in a, in a in a college dorm could say, okay, well people need to be able to interact and talk with each other and evolve an app like Facebook that took off to have well you know a couple billion people in it. Uh, isn't there an even greater need that people have than being able to talk and chat with their friends? The, the need to make a difference in the world, and if, and if we could create a smart gov app uh, that could uh, take what he called synergy, well, he used the book Bucky Fuller model of the uh, geodesic sphere, uh, and if, and imagine like these uh, uh, Zoom type meetings, interactive with people across and from opposite sides of political issues using certain uh, synergistic techniques that instead of fighting against each other in each of these little groups, we're, we're uh, focusing on not who's right and wrong, but evolving what, what is the best way to solve this problem or that, you know, different topics, so that we actually evolve a synergistic system of world governance that, uh, uh, bring, that, 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 that allow, brings to the top the wisdom of each individual and amalgamates that into the will of the people of planet Earth and that could have tremendous power uh, to to get things done because that's where actually things actually get done. It's not bombs and military, which have been a complete failure to make anybody do anything. It's it's people power that really is the truly effective way to uh, enforce to create and enforce uh, you know uh, the kind of peaceful and evolved world we want. And so I guess my question is. Uh, while we're working at the uh, while you're working at the global level to try to move the institutions, and you're doing some fabulous work in that way with parliamentarians and others, how how could we have a a, a group that would begin to uh, actually work on evolving such an interactive uh, smart gov app as Gary called it? I put in the chat uh, a little uh, link to a website where I proposed that to the Funky Fuller Institute. You can see that there, smart-gov.net. Uh, but how can we actually make uh, make that one one of the wings so that you know that can be started immediately? You don't need to have nations agree to it. We just need to do it. And if it takes off and starts having huge numbers of people who are who are empowered to make changes in their community and other places by this really smart app that allows them to take the highest and best wisdom of others and use it in their area and begin to evolve the system, uh, couldn't we begin to? Uh, uh, evolve uh, something parallel that would actually draw in eventually the nation states and others into this interactive system of governance. Uh, and, and my my vision is to both to uh, have a team creating that problems. and okay and putting that into a movie. Thank you. Thanks so much. Really good for bringing in a couple more ways that individuals can get involved. The idea of world citizenship and engaging with an app. We've taken on board those ideas. We're discussing those. We do have another short question or intervention from the table, and then one minute each for the speakers to respond to those. And thank you very much, and apologies to those who haven't been able to have a chance to speak, uh, but we really appreciate all your participation. You're down the end of the table. So first of all, thank you so much for the discussion, and it was really interesting to hear all the input, and um, in particular, I could really relate to it, and especially putting Earth at the center of discussion as everything comes from the Earth and from nature. So it's, um, it's wonderful to hear this. And um, in my work, I work in um, the area of waste management and um, circular economy. So it's more dealing with the end problem already and uh, with all this waste that is created as part of uh, overproduction and consumerism and um, as part of my phd i uh, discovered that one of the issues is really that laws are so outdated mm -hmm. and some in in particular with regards to waste management in, in with regards to food waste management they are not existent really in switzerland but um, with regards to waste management, they're really outdated. Some are 60, 70 years old, and they don't correspond to the problems that we have today and to the waste materials that we have. So my question really is, how can we drive change uh, faster? How can we influence change at the um, law level? And uh, yeah, really change it and, and faster if you have any inputs on this and in particular in Switzerland, I'm sure a global level and in terms of other laws relating to other things apart from waste, they might be also outdated, but yeah, 
Thank you if very you much for your intervention and the question. We're now swinging back to the panelists for one minute to answer one or two of the questions, issues that have been raised. Should we start, Maya, with yourself? Do you sure. Agree? A few, a few thoughts responding to all those um, excellent questions and comments. Um, firstly, just to go back a little bit to the, the trust issue, uh, and that comes up again and again in terms of the international uh, environment and negotiations environment. And just to say that there are techniques also to build trust very quickly in negotiating environments, as we've done on the commission, for example, to have really high consensus uh, amongst a very diverse group of commissioners and experts all around the world. So I think there's a lot we can do to create those conditions uh, for these types of governance transformations. Um, but it is fundamental. Also, as the UN Secretary General has said, uh, we will not, or he says, we, we will not be able to tackle our global challenges unless we act as a human family. <laughs> so, so we have to keep that in the forefront of, of our minds. And that also, of course, ties into the discussions about militarism and, and these, these terrible resurgent conflicts uh, around the world. Um, and just in terms of the, the military, uh, you know, the money that is, that is really wasted, uh, I would, I would just put a bit, bit more into the mix there to say that that is also because we have not updated our international legal peacemaking, peacemaking and conflict uh, dispute architecture. The International Court of Justice needs to be reformed, uh, Chapter 6 of the UN Charter. And that's actually mentioned on peaceful settlement and that's mentioned in the Climate Governance Report. So until also we have that legal architecture to, to really facilitate and, and make peacemaking living side by side as good neighbors at the forefront of our mind also as we think about earth system governance and earth uh, system security, which ties into the, the comment question about human security. We have a little uh, part of our, our flagship report uh, from November on uh, planetary security, new paradigms, earth system security tied very closely to human security. So indeed there has to be a lot of education uh, on this still to really shift our perspectives to, again, strengthen our international uh, rule of law architecture to facilitate peace, which allows country to, to disarm. Uh, just also to mention the International Anti-Corruption Court, uh, not only is grand corruption, uh, uh, high level corruption in countries tied to environmental disruption and poor environmental governance, but also tied to militarism, violations of international law, geopolitical security risks. So just to, to say that there's, there's ways we can tackle this through this international governance lens, and we will continue to do that. And uh, about Cyril's question, what has changed? I think a lot has changed. There's still some formidable barriers, absolutely. But even applying this smart coalition sort of international social technology, I think we can, in fact, uh, achieve a lot if we if we really focus, find some high value changes we want we really want to see work together. Um, the business community now there's such progressive business actors that that we can work with the youth movement, uh, so many more policymakers uh, that want to be involved. And just to respond lastly to the question or the comment, how laws are outdated. And indeed this was, we have a couple of relevant reports in the Climate Governance Commission. Um, whereas progressive businesses, for example, wanting to move faster than the regulatory environment provides. So we have a paper, uh, a proposal on an international policy clearing hub uh, for countries to learn from each other. And so fantastic to hear about that parliamentarians climate group. Uh, maybe we can work with them uh, to, to realize this policy innovation sort of hub clearinghouse because we really have to accelerate the, the thinking, <laughs> the innovative thinking in terms of policy law. And that's at every level, international, national, regional, et cetera. And, and we have the capacity. It's just having having the awareness that we need to, to put our heads together, be creative, and, and also think together. Thanks, Maya. We've got Alexander next, then Arthur. Don't try and answer all the questions. <laughs> You've got one minute. Try and just get one or two at the next. Let Alexander. me. So tempting. Let me, let me not even try. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's the way to circumvent the best. Um, just, just as a closing comment, uh, again, because we won't get to all the integrity there. There's a lot of doom and gloom out there, unfortunately, about the state of climate, the state of politicians, or politics in general, et cetera. Um, the truth is bad enough. We don't need more doom and gloom or, or, or like, like a neg negative painting of the picture. I think to highlight here and what I heard also the last one and a half hours is that we have agency. I think mm -hmm. that is important that we don't forget about it. We have everything in our hands. We have solutions. 
we have problems, but we also know then which laws are outdated, mm -hmm. which kind of parts of the whole system need fixing. It's now about really roll up our sleeves, get into action, use the agency that we have to really tackle the, the hard facts, to, to, to face them, but also then realizing that we have everything we need to solve it. It's just now about let's make this work. And I love that Mega is now coming together to actually do the very thing. So, yeah. Thanks, Thank Alexander. You. We'll go to Arthur one minute and then to Mission and, and then Margareta. Yes, Arthur Nishan and then Margareta and online. Thanks. There was the question about what can individuals do and not denying the importance of global action through Mega. A lot of people interview you in their local community. There's no reason why you cannot read your local reality. Consult others about it. What can we do to address this or that problem as expressed in our community? And let's do some actions, try to improve things, and set an example of better ways of doing things, leaving things to decision makers who are the problem. Everybody has an agency and power as an individual in their community. We can always start there while we're also working at these other levels. So thank you. Thanks, Arthur. Nishan? Thank you. And then we've got Margareta. <laughs> No, oh. Nishan, then up, Margareta, and then John to finish. Thank you, Alan. Uh, thank you, Natalie, for your question. I couldn't agree more. Earth should be at the center of it. And this is where we kind of really unlearn. For example, we need to unpack things like the word biodiversity. Because biodiversity is not about human species and the diversity there. But we understand that the biodiversity, 90% of that is in the soil, which is Earth. And that is something that a lot of people don't understand. And it's a simple thing, but the farmers understand that, and that the farmers are fighting for democratic space at this moment, and they're being murdered. And I think that's where we need to be transformation. I disagree a little bit about that. We need a law for all human complexities. Never going to be achieved. Look at the nuclear weapons. Nuclear weapons are illegal under international law. We have banned the dum dum bullet 300 years ago, chemical and biological weapons, and here we are wondering whether nuclear weapons are illegal. We don't need a specific law to ban that. It is illegal. Thank you. Thanks, Nishan. Margareta, do you have a comment? Yes, thank you. Coming back to the question asked at the table about updating Swiss legislation. Uh, <laughs> Of course, the key is elections, elect parties every four years, which are not on the conservative and right wing side and which take each opportunity to, um, to uh, avoid changes uh, such as the referendum just declared by the right wing party against a uh, law on which we will vote beginning of June which would bring about very, very much needed change in view of renewable, renewable energies. And then I would just like to say, uh, Mika can also link, um, join hands with campaigns such as Law Not War, uh, which favor the concept of common security versus the prevailing the prevailing concept of um, uh, nuclear deterrence, which reigns our lives in big parts of the Northern Hemisphere. Uh, so I think join hands and do not forget a global strike to draw attention or at least other forms of nonviolent direct actions, which could easily be coordinated by this application which was suggested by another uh, speaker earlier in this discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Margareta. And now final speaker, John. Thank you very much. I feel very privileged to be the final speaker. I'll, I'll keep these closing comments to less than 30 minutes. Um, <laughs> so uh, two things I want to touch on. One is all the related issues, um, finance, peace, health, and so on. The governance reforms we propose are general purpose, because of course all these issues are interrelated. And I would frame this not as reforms to global governance in general, it depends who you're speaking to, but for most people, that is not an exciting topic. What we're trying to do is solve common problems. That's what this is all about. And the point I'd like to address is Cyril's point, because I share his thinking completely. We know the problems, we know the solutions, We've known them a long time. Where's the blockage? 
Now, my thinking on that, and I, I feel Cyril knows a lot more about this than I do, but my thinking on this is that the UN, and, and here all my esteemed legal colleagues around me will no doubt correct me afterwards, but the UN was not set up to be an effective governance tool. It was set up to not be able to hold the winners of the Second World War to account. Everybody knew the veto undermined the credibility of the UN from the get-go. So we're talking quite fundamental reform here to create effective and accountable governance at the global level. It's Milton Friedman who said, only a crisis produces real change. Well, as a theory of change from where we are now, advocating a third world war is a slightly risky approach, in my view. The consequences are unpredictable. So given we don't want to advocate the crisis to catalyze the change, what to do? And here I ask the question, qui bono, who benefits? Well, who, who benefits from reforming global governance the way we suggest? Um, well, obviously the small island developing states are disappearing underwater. Um, the middle-sized states, uh, pretty much every state is not a P5 member. All people everywhere, the P5, if they take an enlightened view of their self-interest. And we need to build a movement. As Alexander said, we all have agency. What we need to do as humanity is come together to tell our nations to create the UN we need. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. Thank you to all of the speakers today. Thank you to all of you who have been participating, both in person and online. This is just the start of a conversation and of engagement. We encourage you to keep engaged. Uh, we've got a platform up there, the mega website to look at, and communication is through there, some communication through there, through the newsletter. Uh, also, keep talking with each other and keeping engaged and keep us aware of what you're doing. Uh, this is the key to getting uh, making progress is building good cooperation and mutual support. And we look forward to engaging with you in those ways. I want to thank Rebecca, who's been the co-moderator today. Uh, co-moderating a hybrid event takes a little bit more than just the other ones, and it seems to have worked quite well. Uh, thank you to all the online people. Also, we had some online support uh, staff from Citizens for Global Solutions, one of the co-host organisations, in particular, Julia Bergman. So thank you very much to her. A big thank you to Sydney Austin Law Firm for providing this venue and all the technical facilities of Pro Bono as part of their contribution uh, to this really important endeavour. Please do keep involved and keep engaged, and we look forward to seeing you again, either in person or online in the future. Uh, and remember, we can all make a difference, particularly when we work together. Thank you very much, everyone. Bye. Bye.